Well, this is going to be fun. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Charleston Conference in person. Yay. And welcome to one of my favorite sessions. I love these sessions because we learn a lot in a little bit of time. And so we're going to go ahead. What we'll do is everybody will speak. So if you have any questions you want to ask them, hold those till the end. And then we will have everybody, the speakers, come up and you can ask your questions at that point. So, um, the first speaker is going to be, is it Erin or Ellen? Okay. I'm not sure who's first. I don't mind being first. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Oh. It's loaded. Yeah, we're not loaded. So you want me to? Go ahead. There you go. Okay. Hello. Um, so, I am going to talk to you just for a few minutes about a study that I am working on focused on relevance criteria and online video. Uh, my name is Erin DeWitt Miller. I am a PhD candidate at the University of North Texas, and I am going to tell you about my dissertation in six minutes or less. <laughs> um, so, the study methodology is obviously very briefly, um, it's two phases. So, the first phase was a survey, um, and I was focusing on media professionals, so filmmakers, film distributors, media librarians, um, and then the, and also media art students. And then the second phase is, uh, has been interviews and task analysis, so talking to people. And then the task analysis is having, having participants actually search for online video and talk to me while they do it so that I can better understand information behavior and how people are making relevance judgments. So what is relevance criteria, you might be wondering. Um, so relevance criteria are basically any aspect of an information source that help us decide that it fulfills our information need. So it's really how we decide what's useful about information. This is a list of some common relevance criteria that people use with online video. So people look at things like, is the video quality good? And if it's good, then it's a video that's useful to me. And if it's not good, it's not a useful video. Um, they look at, is it recent, is it accurate, is it reliable, how specific is the information. And people also are doing things like looking at user reviews and ratings of video to help them decide if it's relevant. Um, and then accessibility features are really important as well. And that can be accessibility features of the player. Um, and it can also be accessibility as in like, is it behind a paywall? Can you get to the video quickly? And if not, a lot of people are like, nope, I'm not paying 99 cents for that, I'm going somewhere else. Um, so, why is relevant criteria in online video relevant to us? Well, for one thing, relevance is a core concept in our field. Um, as librarians, as information profession professionals, we think about relevance a lot, right? We talk about it, but there isn't really a definition in the field of what relevance is. Um, and relevance criteria can help us come to a better understanding of relevance. I mean, it's also important because video is now ubiquitous as an information source. People are going to video for information before they go to um, books or text or any more traditional information sources. Uh, and just a tiny little piece of information from the um, findings that they've gotten to show you how ubiquitous using video for information is. So 59% of people that responded to the survey use video at least uh, a few times a week to learn how to do something new. So that would be like cooking or learning how to do a craft or build something. And 72% are using video, looking at video several, several times a week in order to research interesting topics, so to learn about things. Um, so I thought I'd give you just a tiny little peek of some preliminary findings. I think my least surprising finding, at least to me, is that 95% of us are going to YouTube for online information. So whether we like it or not, and what was also interesting to me was a lot of the professionals I talked to seemed sort of embarrassed about this, like, oh, I use YouTube. Like, it's fine. Like, we're all doing it. That's where online video is right now. That is where we go, because that's where we can find it. Um, so another interesting preliminary finding is that um, Relevance criteria are subjective, and they change depending on what information people are looking for. So if, you, if people are looking for a video to learn how to do something new, like cooking or crafting or building something, they're more likely to care about the quality of the video itself. Whereas if they're looking for some, a video to learn about current events or news, the quality of the video is a lot less important. Like people are more willing to watch a low quality 
video because it's news. However, recency is more important if you're looking for video about current events or news, which makes sense, right? Like you don't want a 10 year old video if you're trying to learn about something that happened yesterday. Um, and then another interesting thing that I'm seeing is that relevance criteria now can include interactions more than it used to. Um, an interaction might be a common one actually is scrubbing through a video. So you know when you use your finger and you go quickly through a video to see what's in it? A lot of people are saying if they can't do that, they won't even watch a video. They have to be able to scrub. So that interaction has become a way that people decide that that video is relevant to what they, what they need to know about. And then finally, I think this is my final slide. Um, this isn't exactly relevant related, but I think it's interesting that we're seeing so many issues still with finding video. So even though it's ubiquitous, there are millions of informational videos out there. 80% um, of respondents still struggle to find videos that they need when they want to learn something. And some of the common issues are with discovery, just in general, like setting up the search correctly, narrowing the search down. So when you get 10 million results, how do you get the the actual videos that you want. Um, assessing information in video is especially difficult for people. I think in a lot of ways it's harder than it is with a text-based document because you can't just go and get information about who is who is the creator, what were their sources, where did they find their information. That stuff is a lot more hidden and less obvious when you're looking at um, informational video. Uh, paywall advertisements, those are all issues. Something that I found, found interesting that people are saying is that they struggle because they have a personal disconnect with the information in video. So people are trying to learn from video, but they're getting distracted. They're thinking about other things. The video may not speak exactly to them the way that they want to, so they have a hard time processing that information. So that was a very quick introduction to um, my, my study. If you ever want to talk about it, they can contact me. Great. Okay. Hi, I'm Ellie Kohler, Head of Library Data Analytics and Assessment. And I'm Nature Eastby, Collection Strategist and Assessment Coordinator. Today, we're going to walk through what we've learned about overcoming the sunk cost fallacy in our work at Virginia Tech. So what is the sunk cost fallacy? In short, it's continuing to invest time and resources into a project that isn't working in order to not lose the time and resources already invested. So as the picture shows, it's really holding on to something that is weighing you down. Our remote anchor project was a homegrown database called the CAT, the Collections Assessment Tool, as shown by Grumpy Cat here. Its purpose was to harvest and store counter usage information for electronic resources. And despite spending several years developing the CAT, it wasn't working the way we wanted it to. Today, we will walk you through our evaluation process and we'll show you how to use the steps in your own work. So the first step is identifying that a problem exists and finding the courage to call attention to it. We had a few indicators that the CAT was trapping us in the sunk cost fallacy. Development of the CAT started in 2015, years before either of us started at Virginia Tech, and over six years later, we were still struggling to incorporate the tool into our workflows. We continually pushed back project deadlines, and the atmosphere of team meetings wasn't exactly enthusiastic. At the beginning of 2022, Ellie, as our project leader, recognized the drop in morale and set up one-on-one -on -one meetings with each team member to get structured feedback on the strengths and the weaknesses of the CAT. What she found was that we were all on the same page and that something needed to change. So for your own projects, remember, it's never too late to implement regular and structured opportunities for feedback. And this is the time to trust your gut. You already know when something isn't working. After expressing our frustrations with the cat, it was time to focus on the facts. Why wasn't this working for us? Could we adjust our approach to fix the cat? Or were we attempting a project that was beyond our capacity? We identified what we needed in the usage database, and we assigned weight to each priority, determining whether items were essential or just nice to have. We also did a cursory look at potential third-party solutions to see if they might meet some of our needs, and based on what was out there, decided that a deep dive into tools on the market would be worth the effort. When evaluating your own projects, keep these tips in mind. Establish desired outcomes before exploring new solutions. 
you might find that small changes will solve these frustrating issues. Create spaces for team members to be honest about the team's ability to continue down its current path. And keep the focus on the project, not the people. Always be sure to emphasize it's the project that needs fixing. So after evaluating our needs, we want to be systematic about how we move forward. After all, we'd invested a lot of time and energy into the cat, and we wanted to be sure that our next step would be worthwhile. So we developed an evaluation matrix to compare different systems alongside our own database. The matrix included all the features that we'd identified that we needed in the usage collection tool so we could start to see what each of these systems could provide and how the cat compared. Our matrix demonstrated to us that it was time to end the cat and move on to Lib Insights. Once we made a decision, things moved fast. We decided to sunset the cat at the end of the spring semester this year, and by June, we had begun setting up our Lib Insight instance. Another part of following through was honoring the work that had been done on the cat. We started to brainstorm and implement projects that could build up our database development work. While making a decision to move on is always the hardest part, following through can be tough too. We were able to move fast in part because we built on the momentum and the insights revealed through this decision-making process and used that data to get funding. If at, if at all possible, possible rip off, off the, the band-aid band -Aid as quickly as possible. So, for all, for all tough decisions, decisions, it's important, important to take time to learn from our experiences without, without casting any blame for why something didn't work out. After, After moving to Live Insights, we carved out time to reflect on the CAT project. Our main, our main takeaway was, was that we inherited the CAT and there was a lot we didn't know. A little, a little documentation, documentation would have gone a long way towards our success, success. and we were reminded to use our documentation, documentation to be good to future us or to, or to the people who might take our place. Our, our reflection also reminded us that not all work was wasted. wasted. We all, we all under, better, better understand Counter and Sushi and our vendors, and we're also now better prepared to put our development efforts into data integration projects. As for, as for lessons learned, learned well, we could, we could have made that decision sooner. As the project manager, it was hard to admit that the CAT project was a failure, but it was also my responsibility to not invest time and money into a project that wasn't working. So the best time to start the change process is probably the first time you think about getting rid of a project. We also could have been more transparent. Within our team, we had really good openness and collaboration, but until we involved our bosses in the administration, we could not move to begin the process of acquiring another system. And if you don't ask, they won't know, and they certainly won't offer. Finally, decision making is also always emotional. Change is hard, and it's good to acknowledge that, but also bring in facts and data to help explain your decision. Bring others around to your way of thinking. Thank you, Thank you for listening to us today. I know we provided a whole lot of information in six minutes. We are making a template of our evaluation rubric available. If you have any questions about it or anything else, please reach out to contact us via email. And for that evaluation rubric, you can find it with this QR code and the link. Hopefully, there'll be a chance to share that. Um, sure, we can put that back up later. Perfect. Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Jeff Steiger, Humanities Librarian at the University of Oregon. And the title of my presentation is Why Has Bibli Bibliometry Failed uh, to Measure Up in the Humanities? If you read my abstract, you know that it is impossible to cover what I propose to cover in these few minutes. Here are some of the tasks I was going to attempt. A conceptualization of the nature of humanist inquiry, focusing on the central role played in it by interpretation. Um, an articulation of the sort of explanatory power to which humanists aspire. A redefinition of such concepts as results, research, and knowledge in a humanist context. And following from all that, an argument as to why humanists typically chafe at the thought that the value of their work can be gauged by numbers. Why is six minutes inadequate for what I wanted to explore? Why can't I just outline my results, give you my takeaways? Because in the humanities, the point is not solely the point. 
how one says what one has to say, the context one summons, the evidence one marshals, the stakes one invokes, the judgments one makes, are all part of the point and maybe the better part. What is conveyed in humanistic scholarship is the mental context that lends force, character, and purpose to one's propositions. An article in the humanities is the crystallization of the process of thinking that led to the conclusions, and without which the conclusions would be bare, lackluster statements. A number of practical difficulties have partially frustrated the efforts of bibliometricians to apply their methods to output in the humanities. Yet even if these practical difficulties were surmounted, there would still be the incongruity of applying quantitative standards to qualitative work. For humanists, this incongruity is often felt as an indignity, an imposition of the methods of an alien culture that fails to respect the distinctiveness of an epistemological domain different from the one from which those methods derive. Acknowledging this, some recent bibliometric studies of the humanities have adopted qualitative approaches, such as interviews, to understand the ideas of quality that prevail in the humanistic realm. Along the same lines, one recent survey of the representation of the humanities in bibliometric scholarship calls for new approaches and a renewed theoretization of the humanities. I thought, from the side of the humanities, I try to contribute something to the beginning of an answer to such a call. My idea was to draw from existing portrayals of humanities work by humanists. For haven't they theorized themselves abundantly? A splendid recent example is to be found in Stefan Collini's book, What Are Universities For?, in which at one point he takes up the rhetorical predicament of humanists called upon to defend the value of their work. Rejecting the common conception, valid perhaps for other areas of intellectual endeavor, that skills plus information equals knowledge, Collini proposes that a better formula for humanistic work would be experience plus reflection equals understanding. He then observes, it is vital to emphasize that the goal of work in the humanities is better described as understanding than as knowledge. One of the consequences of insisting on that distinction is the recognition that whereas knowledge is seen as in some sense objective, out there, a pile or hoard that exists whether anyone is tending it or not, in which any suitably energetic person can climb to the top of, understanding is a human activity that depends upon the qualities of the understander. This is to say that the humanity that the humanities are humanistic not solely by virtue of the fact that they are concerned with human cultural expressions, but also by virtue of the fact that the study of those expressions necessarily reflects the cast of the mind of the one studying them. One reads, say, a great critic less for their conclusions about a particular author than for the discernment and perspicacity displayed in the course of their exposition. One implication of this for the present discussion is that the only way to adequately gauge the value of a piece of humanistic scholarship in which the qualities of the understander are intrinsically bound up with its ideas is through the appraisal of another understander. This is why quantitative measures seem so misplaced when applied to humanistic work. And I think we all know this. What I am doing then is performing an operation that is quintessentially humanistic namely taking something we know in a casual, unreflective way and amplifying that knowledge, trying to bring home its meaning and implications with renewed force so, so that we know what we know better. I hope the contribution to our understanding of these matters that this miniature presentation has made is to increase our appreciation of the extent of the gulf between the ethos of humanistic work and the ethos of quantitative measurement with with its pedigree in non-humanistic disciplines. That is not a finding, but I like to think it may have boosted our understanding of the complexities involved in the attempt by library science to reckon with the matter of value in the humanities, at least a little. Thank you. Okay. The 
assessing the assessment, an examination of electronic resource usage data and its applications. I'm Rich Wisniewski at Miami University in Ohio. In April 2022, EBSCO published a white paper, Analytics Play a Key Role in Campus Library Operations. The researchers surveyed academic librarians in fall of 2021. The writers state, quote, in many libraries, there are either too few analytic tools in use or else librarians aren't happy with the current tools they have. This presentation expands on EBSCO's findings. Collection management librarians from Ohio's OhioLink Cooperative Information Resource Management, or CIRM committee, were surveyed in the summer of 2022 on their use of electronic resource statistics, specifically how frequently they collect data, for what purposes, and in what formats. I will discuss the results of the survey and propose revisiting what data e-resource librarians collect, how often this work should occur, and for what purposes beyond retention and cancellation decisions. Respondents came from a variety of institutions, from community colleges to small private universities to large four-year public universities and special libraries, such as medical and law. They serve populacies ranging from fewer than 5,000 to over 15,000 FTE. Respondents were asked who collects use, uses data for e-resources. It's interesting to note here the different library staff who are tasked with this work. In some instances, it's not just e-resource librarians, but those who oversee collections, acquisitions librarians, department heads, and in one case, a staff member. Some reported that data can come from more than one librarian. What wasn't asked, but might be interesting for future study, is what training librarians had and whether their roles influenced what kinds of data they collected. I was curious what formats those who request e-resource usage data wanted, especially at a time when there was growing emphasis on data visualization tools such as Tableau and Exploratory. Most respondents preferred Excel, although it's unknown whether they also utilized within Excel pivot charts and tables and Excel graphs. Then there was the question of how frequently data is requested for particular e-resource types. The types didn't seem to matter as much. Collecting data occurs at least quarterly, but in many cases annually or on an as-needed basis. What I was particularly interested in was, from all of the counter and even non-counter compliant reports that one can obtain, what kinds of data do collection managers and those responsible for collection budgets find most useful? While cost per download and longitudinal data may not be too surprising, counter data on searches internal ways still scored somewhat low. All choices, however, were selected to some extent, which led to the next two questions. What did respondents find most and least useful and why? Taking a look at what respondents found most useful, while cost per use may not be surprising, it is nonetheless important to note the reasons why, which often connects to tight budgets, justification for costs, and what is most familiar. For example, quote, CPU is quick, common, and an historic way to look at things, unquote. Conversely, least useful data pertain to search and overlaps. One response in particular I wish to highlight here, that being the comment about the discovery layer. The distinction is made between what data is relevant to examining a library's discovery layer or access points and what data is relevant to retention and cancellation decisions. Similar to the EBSCO study, I was curious to know what kinds of data those responsible for collections would like to see. Here's where respondents mentioned data outside of counter, such as who exactly is using resources and where the resources are being found. Lastly, respondents were asked to provide additional comments. One comment, while honest and perhaps a bit tongue in cheek, nonetheless harkens back to a criticism that is sometimes made about the nature of presenting statistics. They can tell any story you want them to. Takeaways. This study is only a start and bears expansion to see if the sentiments expressed hold for other consortiums. I think it's important to scrutinize the data we collect. What stories is data collection ultimately trying to tell? And what are the ramifications for these stories? Should our analysis of e-resource usage data be separate from our analysis of access points, such as discovery layers? Should data analysis primarily center on cost? I leave you with a response from one of our campus community in conclusion. 
quote, I try to access resource and it sent me to a screen requiring me to give my email address to check my access. I am logged in and logged into the library's website. It then informed me it would check my access and sent me an email. Seriously, I have to get an email every time I want to log into this? All the major systems that we have access to are becoming less user friendly and with more things we have to look up, more clicks, more wasted time. This is really going backwards. In analyzing the data we collect, its impact on collection budgets and retention decisions, I would argue for scrutinizing data collection practices and coupling such practices with examining this, the discoverability of and access to our resources, or lack thereof. Statistics may indeed tell us whatever we want them to. The end user experience can tell us what statistics leave out of the equation. Thank you. Stay online, and because he's um, zoomed in, and so the speakers that are here in person come on up and uh, we'll take some questions. And then you can stand up when questions are asked. Just go up to the, so we can get the video. Yeah. Great. All right. Anybody have a question you want to ask? Yeah. Hey, um, I don't know your oh, name, oh, in the room. Sorry. <laughs> is this working? Yeah. Um, my question is about when you got access to Live Insight, was it like, a big learning curve? Was it a breath of fresh air on functionality? What was your experience with, you know, implementing that? Um, so we're kind of still in the process, um, uh, but it's been mostly a breath of fresh air. Um, now that we're kind of actually, we've got all our sushi providers set up and all of that, like that was just so easy. <laughs> and to see where everything's going, and that was really lovely. Um, you know, now that we're actually trying to look at what the usage, you know, that we're getting, there's things that I would like to see that I'm not, um, which, you know, we knew that moving to anything was going to be accepting that it wasn't perfect, which is, I think, you know, what really had us stuck trying to make our own to want it to be perfect for exactly what we wanted, and how can we make our usage and, and have it, you know, um, be just something that we have that we're not sharing with a third party. We can make all the features that we want, but the thing is, we were not, uh, we didn't have the capacity to do that. So, um, to have something that works that we can go to, because right now a lot of our usage is just in the Google Drive, in CSV files, <laughs> it's not user friendly, it can be a real headache just to get one number for a single resource. Um, so that's been absolutely lovely. I think we're still kind of in the evaluation phase, if we're not necessarily committed to staying that. Um, you know, the route of live inside, but we're trying something new, just getting a sense of keeping a product um, that's not a homegrown product. So, thank you. Great. Thank you. Anybody? Any questions? Great. So, hi, I'm Tasha Mellons coming from Counter. So, I have a question about. Uh, humanities and my experience with with STEM authors is that they also do not appreciate their work being boiled down to numbers so I would love to understand um, the degree to which you, you had conversations across disciplines to to see whether the sort of understanding aspect that you're bringing to humanities could have value in other disciplines as well uh, very good question. Um, I, mean, I was mainly investigating the, uh, the research in which it seemed like even if you know, there is some resistance among um, all, you know, in all fields um, to having people's, to having your work uh, reduced to numbers, um, that the feeling from the standpoint of the bibliometricians in the world of library science was that there had been notable successes in the STEM fields, whereas they seem to encounter a lot of um, you know, uh, resistance in the humanities and there was just more acknowledgement that because of the, the nature of the humanities, um, that there, there was always going to be this this tension. And then, you know, some of it is anecdotal. I know that at my own university, when um, there was a new proposal for, you know, metrics of all different kinds of research excellence, there was, um, you know, pretty pronounced opposition on the part of, of the humanists who felt that they were being, 
you know, sort of um, shunted into, uh, you know, an area that they didn't really feel uh, comfortable with. Um, but that, but uh, your point is well, well taken. And um, I mean, of course, the difference between knowledge and understanding is, is kind of a, a fluid one in that the sciences too would ultimately be aspiring through the acquisition of knowledge to you know, arrive at a broader understanding of whatever phenomena they're investigating. But um, in the humanities, it, it's sort of part of the definition of what uh, humanists are doing is that they're, they're really um, you know, looking for perspective and for that, um, you know, what uh, Colini called understanding. Other questions? As for 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 another person for which oh good okay if I'm allowed to ask yeah, a second you question are. then uh, Richard I was interested to hear that you had found a similar uh, lack of interest in turnaways to that was uh, that that was something that was reported uh, quite frequently in our in our library uh, information gathering sessions last year. And I was wondering if you would be willing to have conversations so we could exchange information, uh, maybe after the conference. Yeah, no, I'd be happy to do that because I, I do find that very interesting when the uh, responses come back to me. So absolutely, um, I'd be happy to. Great. Okay, so uh, I mean, Erin, Erin. Um, um, lots of libraries are spending lots of money on streaming services. Are, is your research touching on that at all? Or? Go. Um, so you mean, am I looking specifically at what libraries are providing this well, I, uh, Yeah, are you looking at like Canopy and all of those? Not specifically. So indirectly in Yes, because I'm just looking at online video, but what I, the way I'm trying to look at it is with as much authenticity as possible for what people are doing. So when I ask people how they're using online video, some people say they go to the library and use library resources like Canopy, um, and that's great, but it's not like, a, it's not a focus, if that right. makes sense. Yeah. So I have written some papers and um, things about streaming and how it's managed because I, as a uh, media librarian, that was a huge focus for me, was managing all of those. But in this specific paper, not, not exactly. We have one minute left. Does anybody else have a question? Thanks, hi, I'm Matthew Goddard, Iowa State. I have a question for Ellie. So um, when I was listening to your talk, the so example of so you, your comments were uh, addressing a, a project at, at Virginia Tech. When I think of sunk costs in the context of my experience in libraries, it, I really think of the, the collections and especially um, one time purchases that were maybe made a long time ago and have some ongoing fees associated with them. Um, those are uh, sometimes challenging to know how to handle, especially if usage plummets because maybe a, you know, someone somebody left or something. But I think there's a, a uh, uh, I think there's a real application for the sunk cost fallacy there. I'm just curious if that, if, how you would apply your thinking, since this is something you've thought of, you thought about quite a bit, how you apply it to that kind of question. Yeah, I mean, that's a, a great question. Um, I'm trying to think. So, you know, part of how we use our usage, as everyone here does, is to evaluate our subscriptions. Um, and we don't have a perfect system, mostly because we haven't had a great system to, um, get our usage, so there's a lot of things I would like to do that we haven't done yet, but one of the things I've been trying to do in my role is really capture the usage, not just for titles, but for the subscription itself, right, and kind of to, to get all those bundles together and things like that and see that over time. And I think just being able to see that, which I, it may it's fairly, um, I'm sure everyone's doing it, so it's not groundbreaking, but just to be able to see usage going down, um, and then actually to an earlier point about turnaways, to kind of compare some of that, um, really bringing that data in makes those decisions so much easier um, to just be able to say, hey, like this isn't getting utilized and we can investigate why, right? It doesn't mean that we have to necessarily completely throw it out the window, but to say, hey, like someone, like this is obviously a resource people really want. 
um, and this is one that people aren't using as much, uh, to have that right together in the same place uh, makes those decisions much better. And I think it's a little bit, in my mind, it's a little bit easier to make that decision or at least advocate for that decision because I ultimately don't um, make that decision for our library, but than it is to have invested into a project that could potentially still blossom. Um, that's a little bit more emotional, uh, at least for me, to, to let it go. So, does that answer your question? Yep, yeah, thank you. Yeah. I think we're out of time, guys. Let's give a round of applause to everybody. Richard, thank you. For being here.